IT voice it for us at a later date. So I don't know how many people typically join on YouTube to watch us live and not participate through Zoom, but unfortunately they won't have that option this evening. People are having difficulties with that. Okay. Um, and everyone who's on Zoom has already been given the link, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, everyone on Zoom is good to go. It's just YouTube is going to be the issue to me. Okay. Um, well, welcome everyone. Uh, let's get started with uh, if you can call roll of the commissioners, and then we'll and then guests, and we'll go from there. Lots, lots of folks here tonight again. So thank you all for coming. Sure. So I'll I'll call roll for the commission, and then we can have guests introduce themselves. Great. That works for you. Okay. Um. All right. We'll start in person. Randy here. Chuck here. Marla here. Richard here. Is everyone in person with us? All right. On to the remote. Uh, Rita. She waved. She waved. Um, she's there. Yeah. I'm mute. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Jessica. Here. Pete. Here. Noah. Here. Here. You all. Um, and April. Oh. April Sider, Town Council. And Town um, Staff. Eric Sanderson, Planner. Jamie Fitch, Sustainability Coordinator. And Todd, Todd, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Todd, who's the director of community services. Great. And then here in the room, guest Maggie Vishno. And uh, on screen, um, first uh, Jesse, and then Rodney. Hi, I'm Jesse. Are you the from Flycatcher? Fly okay, great. Yes. Thanks. You both from Flycatcher? I think so. Rodney, uh, yeah, I'm, Rodney and I'm from Flycatcher as well. Great, thank you. And then we do have um, one other guest in attendance um, viewing. Okay. Is that who you? Yes. All right, so Kathleen Miller, welcome. If you wish to participate at any time, feel free to just raise your hand and someone in the room will notice it. <laughs> thank you everyone for coming. Um, uh, I'd like to begin with our land acknowledgement. Um, beginning our time together with an acknowledgement honoring all indigenous people, the people who came here before us and nurtured this place as stewards of Mother Earth, the first people. I make this acknowledgement aware that this is land that is unceded and that issues of water and territorial rights and encroachment on sacred sites are ongoing in the Wabanaki homeland. I acknowledge the Waskawak people who once lived in what is now Scarborough. And that as we support efforts for land and water protection, we honor the current tribes who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Um, any comment on the minutes from the last meeting? Can we just say that we're there approved by? Yeah. Technically, we need to vote. Take a vote. Okay, let's take a vote. I make vote. We vote. Great, right. sure. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Pete. Roll call. I'll do it quickly, I hope. Uh, Randy. Yes. Chuck. Yes. Marla. Yes. Pete. Yes. Uh, Noah. We'll come back to Noah. Rita. Yes. I'm yes. sorry. No, Noah's a yes. Thank you. I, and I heard Rita also. Thank you. That's unanimous. All right, great. <laughs> um, so just a review of the agenda and um, here it says changes, which is just noting the change with the first. Or if anyone has any changes okay. to make. Great. So we'll we'll um, begin this, this evening with um, a conversation with Flycatcher. Jesse and Rodney are here with us on Zoom uh, to talk about the work that they're doing and what they're looking for from the from the commission. Um, we will um, review, and thanks, um, April, for your uh, report out in writing about the town council workshop. We'll have some time to talk about that. Um, I'll touch on what happened at the Maine Association Conservation Commission's annual conference. We'll have a report out from the education subcommittee. And then um, anticipating that the town council's GMO update 
group is going to be asking committees questions. Um, we have some time to talk about that as well. And then our standard updates. Um, oh, I'm looking at the old agenda. There, where do we put the um, under new business? Uh, it's under the elect scheduling the election. Yeah, yeah, it's under new business item number four. Okay, and um, and then we'll talk about um scheduling election of an of a chair and vice chair um uh and other notes about that. Um, just setting aside time to talk about that, and then um, that's it. Any updates that folks want to include? Welcoming uh, Emily to the the group. No worries. Thank you for coming. Okay. All right. So, um, Ray, yeah. Randy, sorry. Can I just add it? Um, I think our agenda is probably too full, but at some point, it would be good if I could have an opportunity in the future meetings just to keep everybody updated on the land bond board and sort of the work that we're doing as well. Awesome. Can we add that as, as a, a yeah. yeah. So we're gonna add that as a regular update from here on out. Um, that's great, thank you. Um, so uh, Rodney or Jesse, if you want to um, kind of take over and give us a little bit of an overview of what you are looking for from us this evening. And um, I'm sure everyone at the table will have some questions and ideas for you. Um, Randy and I did chat um, before the meeting and because this is an open and public meeting, we thought that rather than saying specific in the meeting in terms of um, specific parcels that we might wanna recommend, um, that we can maybe talk in generalities. And if um, uh, folks have ideas on specific parcels, I can follow up with the, the fly catcher folks afterwards with that information. Um, if that works for everyone around the table in the Zoom land. And then just before, um, to, to add to what Jamie's asking, uh, can you touch on sort of timeline, the groups that you've already had conversations with what you're looking for from the Conservation Commission that's different from what you've already learned from other groups. Um, yeah, just sort of give us a lay of the land there too. Thank you. Yes, sure. Um, I'll just reintroduce myself. Um, Rodney Kelshaw with Flycatcher LLC. And um, down there is, is Jesse with Flycatcher. And so we're an environmental consulting company based out of Yarmouth. And currently, um, we are working on the Gorm Connector project for the MTA, and we're subcontracted through their engineering company, HNTB. And so it started out that we were the company that went out and mapped the um, environmental resources in the proposed project area. So that's wetlands, streams, vernal pools, water bodies. And so we're we're in the process of doing that and um, finalizing those that mapping effort now. And then uh, several of us at Flycatcher have been involved with other large projects in the state of Maine that had to come up with big compensation packages for impacts associated with their their uh, projects. So knowing that um, HNTV, that's part of what we were hired to do was map the resources and then figure out how mm -hmm. to compensate for the unavoidable impacts to resources as part of the project. So um, we're getting to the point where we, we know what we have for uh, resources, we know where they are, and where uh, because this the comp, uh, developing a compensation package can take a while, um, if you want to come up with what we're calling a, a robust and comprehensive package, then we wanted to start the outreach uh, on the early side of things. So um, sometimes when projects impact resources, they will uh, they'll just uh, compensate for it by paying to, in to the um, in lieu fee process now through the MNRCP. So they cut a check, and you know that's that's all they need to do. Um, we're anticipating that with this project, there will probably be more than that. Um, so we're looking at uh, not not just paying in the loop fee, that'll probably happen as well, but uh, looking for opportunities to come up with um, areas to preserve if we know that there are uh, 
wetlands and water courses or water bodies within the vicinity of the project where there are impacts that people know about that um, we could do something meaningful and restore those impacts. So that's why we've we've started this. It's it's a pretty large process. Um, we can look anywhere in the greater watershed, which goes all the way up um, past uh, uh, Sebago Lake up to um, Jesse, name of the town? Bethel. Bethel, thank you. Why do we do this every time? Uh, it can go all the way up to Bethel, but what we're really trying to do where the project is here, we're trying, we're trying to keep the package as, um, as local as possible. And so what, we're, what we started doing was what, just reaching out to the municipality. <laughs> Pardon? It was a sneeze. Yeah. <laughs> uh, bless you. <laughs> um, so we, we started by reaching out to the municipalities where the project is going to occur. And um, as part of that process was rolling out, people got excited. So then they were reaching out to some of the land trusts that are in the area as well. So um, currently we've, we've reached out to Portland, South Portland, Scarborough, uh, Gorham. We've had conversations with some of the local land trusts and um, like Long Creek Watershed. Uh, so that's some of the outreach we've had so far. And basically what, what we've been asking for from everyone thus far and what we wanted to discuss with you all tonight was, um, you know, as, as we pull this together, there, there are going to be, if the project moves forward, there are going to be, you know, impacts to you know, stream crossings and wetlands crossings, uh, things like that. So what we're trying to find out is, are there any, um, pet, say, pet projects or known locations of wetland impacts or stream impacts that are local that, um, as part of this process, if it if it meets the you know, if it meets the goals and meets the standards of, of this entire process, we might be able to put into the package and um, help restore some of these areas. And then on top of that, are there um, parcels in the area that you know of that um, maybe the um, the conservation commission has had its eye on for several years because it's it's just an important parcel to preserve to to help uh, to preserve watershed um, health within you know within the area. So we know that there are people that deal with this every day, <laughs> like you all do, and we don't. Um, so we're just coming to find out if if we can help you, and you can help us, and we can float float all ships at the same time. So that's sort of the general. I tried to cover everything as in short a time as possible. So let me know if that was too short on anything and, and if I can you know, expand on something. Thank you. Um, but Pete, do you wanna ask your question? That you sure. Uh, yeah, sure. I put it in the chat, but thanks Rodney. Um, I, guess, I guess my question is, is it's kind of hard to feel like we're maybe putting the cart before the horse almost if we don't know the acreage of impacts Therefore, we don't we don't know the exact route. We don't know the exact acreage of impacts. So we really don't know the exact acreage of land that we're looking to conserve potentially. Um, that said, I think it's very very important um, that anything that happens in Scarborough from a conservation standpoint, we'd like to see that occur in Scarborough. Um, not a fan of impacts in one town and then conserving something in another town. Um, we have some specific goals that we've been working on in the as a commission and also in conjunction with the land trust um, that really is trying to focus on conserving land within Scarborough itself uh, to maintain a quality of life and an access to, you know, open space um, that that we currently enjoy. Um, so question and then I guess just a statement. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I agree. And you know, having been having been doing this stuff for over twenty years now, uh, <laughs> you know, back in the day before the NLP process, we saw a lot of projects where somebody would have some impact and they do a, a 0.1 acre restoration project and they preserve three acres. And we started calling them dink and dunk projects because they were they were a little here and a little there. And 
um, they, they didn't really accomplish much, even though they were close to where the impact was sometimes. And so the NLU fee process um, was set up to help um, alleviate that, where instead of having little projects that didn't really accomplish anything, it was an opportunity to pool money and do large projects that, that made sense from, um, from a, say a, a larger watershed standpoint. Unfortunately, sometimes what that does is just like what you described, Pete, where um, you'll have an impact in Portland, and when they when they divvy out the money, you know, at the end of the year, maybe no projects in Portland get picked because there are better projects on the list of, of ones that re requested in the money. So it can definitely happen, um, and and seeing that that's one of the reasons why. Um, you know, we, we wanted to have the outreach to folks like you and say, hey, do you have these, like I, I call them the pet projects, but just places you've talked about for years, you drive by and go, man, look at that culvert, fish can't get up through there. Areas that we wouldn't know about that could be meaningful um, and beneficial for the community. So that's, that's yeah, that's what we're looking for now. And, and um, like what was said earlier, we, we don't necessarily need the tax map and lot number tonight and things like that. But what we were really looking for is to get the word out and, you know, start a discourse and a conversation about um, what we're looking for. But because at the end of the day, too, we may even come up with projects that we think are really cool and would be really beneficial. Um, but when it comes to putting the package together and providing to the regulators at the end, they might go, yeah, that's really cool. But for somebody else, because it doesn't match the types of impacts you have in your project, so we can't include it. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see what shakes out at the end of the day. <laughs> gotcha, thanks. Um, I will say, from the, uh, then I'll jump off so other people can make comments, but uh, um, that I know one of the priorities is to try to look at contiguous habitat adjacent to the Nonsuch River its existing tributaries. And I know there are um, some restoration projects that the town is already trying to undertake in some impaired water bodies around town. Um, uh, and then there was a restoration project. Uh, Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong, but was it Stewart Brook? Phillips Brook. Phillips Brook. Um, that was gonna have like trout restoration and all kinds of stuff. I don't know what the status of that is, but uh, I know those are several of the key areas that we were interested in and um, the land trust was also interested in. How are you uh, making your decisions? So far, we're pretty early on in the process. So right now we've been um, collecting, whether it be uh, like points on a map, if somebody knows about a, a perched culvert where um, native can't make it back up through or a parcel that's of interest or something like that. And um, we have a GIS viewer that we put together that we can take these, these locations, put them on the viewer. Um, and then within that, we have the NWI wetlands, um, hydric soils, wetland soils, um, stream, the stream mapping that the uh, federal government has. So we, we were able to take all of this data and do uh, a first run sort of um, desktop analysis of the site because part of it is, uh, you know, we want to we want to protect and restore wetlands and that sort of thing. But if there's all wetland on a site, sometimes that that doesn't rise to the level of preserving it because you wouldn't be able to impact it anyway. So part of this is also is it under threat for development. Um, so that's one of the things we take into consideration where is, is there an interspersion of upland that somebody could come in and impact several acres of wetland to develop it. Um, something that we also have on the viewer is known um, conserved lands. So like what Pete was saying, we're, we're trying to either look for some larger parcels or maybe they're smaller, but they're adjacent to or across the street from a connected parcel for a, um, we're hearing about more um, trails and paths that we're trying to get connectivity with. So, you know, um, those, those are all things that go into the matrix. And then um, 
at, at the end, they'll all get, will, you know, each one will, will have sort of a write up of the, the pros and the cons and they'll all get weighed against each other. Um, so that's the, that's the process of it. We're just starting to get into that part of the process now is getting the first ones on a map and, and see if it, uh, if they get to the, the level of, okay, maybe now we should do a site walk or some, you know, something like that. And is there, uh, okay, so site walk suggests that, but I'll just ask the question, uh, is there another pass through these groups? So would we have another chance to, you know, do our Pete Slavinsky pitch for, you know, what happens in Scarborough stays in Scarborough. We want whatever is going to happen. Um, no, this is your this is your only chance. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I want to be like that pushy salesman. No, you, you've got to order. It. <laughs> Act um, now. No, we, we want this to be a collaborative process. And um, we've seen in the past where I've looked at maps and gone, this is going to be a great site. And then I've gone out there and went, oh, the government mapping wasn't very good. And that's really not what's here. And it, it, um, it, it wouldn't be a good fit for, for what we're looking for. So, um, but yeah, part of this that you down the road when we get there, some of these will probably rise to the point where we want to get boots on the ground and see what's actually out there. Okay, um, yeah. Jessica has a question, thank you. Right, so my question was, is this a one for one mitigation ratio? I mean, I know typically for wetlands, it's much higher than that, especially if it's um, preservation versus, you know, okay. So I guess I was wondering what the what the ratio is. I, obviously, we don't know what's going to be impacted, but then um, what sort of mitigation levels are we thinking about? Yeah. So um, it the short answer is it depends, and the devil's in the right. details. But yeah, it's it's not a one for one uh, preservation. You need more than that. They have starting ratios for some of these things, and then. Um, and, and I was going to start throwing out numbers, but I'm, I'm not going to only because as, as the processes go on, um, the, the ratios can go up and down. Uh, wetlands of special significance require higher ratios. Um, emergent, emergent marsh wetlands do, you know, unless it's, a, unless it's a certain type of managed wetland and then the ratio can come back down. So. The short answer is it's not a one for one. Typically, it's higher than that, and preservation is is even you know more than that. Um, that's why it is nice to have if you can have a, if you can find a site that is a big site to preserve, but then on it there's also opportunities for restoration, enhancement, or creation of wetlands. Um, then you know then then the ratios change depending on what you can do there. And sorry, as a follow on, I see Noah's hand is up. Are there any species of uh, special significance that there would also be a mitigation related to impacting that habitat? Uh, there are no um, RTE uh, wildlife species. We do have a couple of plant species that are within the search area. Um, and I have a draft report in my email from the <laughs> from the specialist that did that mapping. Um, so I don't know if if those areas are actually going to be within the impact area or not, but there are some within the survey area. Yeah. Um, Noah and then Marla. Thanks, Randy. Um, and uh, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. It's interesting to hear you all talk. And um, I just really want to follow up on, on Jessica's point. This is a, I'm, I'm really struggling with this conversation and that frankly, this is, to me, it feels like the way this is happening is kind of the opposite of, of what we know about conservation biology, you know, saying that we have some impact and so we're just going to have this conversation rather than having a discrete idea of this is how much it's going to be impacted. And so, you know, for example, you know, the University of New England recently did a project where they conserved 15 acres for every one acre of vernal pools that were impacted. So with that, you can really kind of have a conversation about what you want to look for. Um, you know, so that being said, I realize you're saying you're just sort of here to talk at high level. Uh, I really think that we, we have a, a wonderful new map of conserved areas for our town. 
Um, there's, uh, two, there's two maps that are slightly competing. We have a, a map that was produced by our GIS folks for the town. And then there's also a map that was produced by the land trust. Um, they're similar, but a little different. And I really think that any conversation about where we would choose to conserve lands need to start with that map and follow the guidelines of everything we know from conservation biology, thinking about connectivity, thinking about protecting water resources and trying to have large tracks. And that, you know, rather than saying, oh, does anybody know a parcel that we should buy? We should, we should focus on our landscape and try to work out through the landscape. So I, I really encourage us to have a conversation towards that. And um, anyway, that's my two cents. Well, and, and to your point, Noah, that's, that is, uh, and may, I, maybe I didn't say it, um, I went faster than I should have, so I skipped maybe some of the, the finer points, but um, yes, exactly what you're just saying. So knowing that somebody has already done more homework than we have on this, you, you all know more about your community than we do. Um, you know more about the connectivity and, and having these maps and things like that. Like, that is what we're here to find out. So we can take all of that into consideration early on in the process, because what we don't want to do is, um, you know, just go out on our own and, and try to find things that we think make sense. And then um, have, have people go, well, it doesn't, and here's why, and you should have known this, but you didn't come talk to us. So um, I, I almost feel like no matter how we sort of, come about it, there, there can always be a little cart before the horse. Um, but this, this was the way we just decided we, we wanted to, we wanted to start approaching, approaching folks that are in the know and, and see if we can, um, you know, start down the right path. Thanks, Marla. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention something that is our, um, that's truly a gem in Scarborough. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's the Scarborough Marsh. And I just wanted to advocate for its protection. I mean, it's, it's an incredible estuary and it's incredibly rare. Salt marshes are very rare in the state of Maine. It's about 19,000 acres of salt marshes in the entire state. Our, our salt marsh is about 3,200, so 3,200 acres. And uh, that's a very small amount considering the state of Maine is about 21 million acres. But it's very rare. So like 3-4% of Maine's entire wetland acreage. So I just wanted to put a plug in for the Scarborough Marsh. And I think there's a lot of potential for protection projects. Some smaller, some larger, but um, you know, the state of Maine does manage the Scarborough Marsh, um, and it's highly valuable in terms of wildlife for species. It's an estuary for all kinds of wildlife, including lots of fish and clams and all sorts of critters. So um, I think there's some potential there. Thank you. And can I add on to that? That um, the town within the past five years or so completed the um, Phillips Brook Watershed Management Plan. Pete kind of alluded to it earlier, but there are some sites called out in that plan for stream restoration. So um, I can send you all the link to that report, but Phillips Brook is a tributary to Scarborough Marsh. Um, so if, if you're looking for stream restoration, there are opportunities there. Um, and then also when we had kind of emailed a bit earlier, um, I had called out uh, Red Brook. We also have a Red Brook watershed management plan. Um, the town is going to be doing an update to that over the next couple of years. But um, it's my understanding that some of the, the um, connector corridor will probably go through the Red Brook watershed. That one's an urban and hairy stream as well. So any um, kind of low impact techniques that can happen in that area, I know that this isn't what you guys are doing, but just putting it out there. Um, and then other uh, restoration or conservation opportunities within the Red Brook watershed, I think are going to be really important since the road itself is likely to impact water quality as well. Yeah, and, and I did skip over this too, um, but when it comes to um, sort of wet, the wetland, uh, wetland mitigation, 
the process goes avoid, minimize, and then what you can't avoid and minimize, that's what we're compensating for. So, uh, so that is that is part of the front end process is they have been attempting to come up with uh, come up with ways to minimize direct impacts to um, resources and then also these secondary impacts as well. So yeah, and then it, within within these urban impaired watersheds, like how how can we minimize it even more? But yeah, that's the the engineers are doing that, most of that. Noah again. How can we um, totally avoid uh, payments into the in lieu instead and instead focus entirely our you know any resource that comes from this towards actual on the ground buying of of conservation land? That's a, a great question. Um, I think. You know, if we come up with a a really compelling plan, we could. I get the sense that because the in lieu fee process is there, that there will be um, the expectation that some money will go into that fund. Now, that's not because we've had meetings, and that's you know we've been told that. It just through the way the process works, that's that's the assumption that we're making at this time. So as we get further down the line, um, you know, how high or low that number might be, or if it could be avoided, if we found some really compelling projects within the watershed, then, you know, we might be able to do that. Um, but again, er early on in the process right now to be able to say. Can I also just share too that um, the town has what's called a compensation fee utilization plan for Red Brook, which means that any um, impacts to Red Brook, if an in lieu fee is paid, that money comes to the town and we direct how those monies are spent as opposed to going to the state wetland bank and having um, uh, mitigation happen you know, anywhere throughout the state. So if there is fees within the red or if there are impacts anticipated within the red brook watershed and an in lieu fee is paid that fee i believe should come to the town and we will um, be able to direct what restoration happens within the red brook watershed that's um, a great way to do that I, I wonder why more towns haven't tried that. <laughs> it's a process you can set up through dep they just need to approve your plan and then Pete. I have a quick follow up. Um, I think Jamie, this might be a question for you actually. <laughs> but uh, uh, Rodney, you brought up an interesting point that I hadn't thought of before, but that's like improving flow in existing areas, you know, working on problem culverts. So this is, I guess, for Jamie, do we have a, a list of problem culverts that, say, Public Works has already identified within these watersheds? Um, I mean, within the Scarborough River watershed is really where I'm mainly focused, but the non sogenous chibs is, is again, where, I, where my my interest really is. And I think that, you know, the commission's interest probably aligns with that relatively well. We already have a list of those culverts. I mean, is there like a, as part of capital improvement, we're like, you know, this is this is on the top of the list. This one's a little bit lower. This one's a little bit lower, but having that list be very helpful uh, in terms of maybe trying to bring up some of these and tying them to this project in association with, you know, efforts at Redbrook or Phillips or whatever else. Yeah, so there is a list of problem culverts or potential hazards within the Cumberland County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Um, so the, the town provides that information to the county to put into the plan. Um, and the plan's necessary for if anything happens to these culverts in a federally designated storm, we'll, they'll be eligible for FEMA funding. But that doesn't mean that we can't address them otherwise. So I think that that would probably be the first place to look. Um, I mean, the, we, the town is actually working on, um, we got an infrastructure grant um, to look at design work for two culverts on um, Millbrook, on um, Sawyer Road and Sawgrass Drive. And that's to replace those two culverts would be a million dollar project. And we were going to go after additional funding, um, but there's nothing available to us right now to fix those culverts. So. Um, those culverts were related to like bacterial pollution and things like that. So 
we're going to have a design for, for culverts that need to be replaced on Millbrook um, right in, you know, our backyard here. Um, but yeah, there are other, there DOT or um, DEP, no, sorry, Public Works. Um, maintains a list as part of the hazard mitigation plan. I'm not sure if they've got kind of a secondary um, like watch list for culverts as well, but I can look into that. Okay, thanks. Um, Dick. Could you send us links to all our different culvert information? Yeah, I can send you a link to the, um, to the hazard mitigation plan that has that information. Noah, did you have something more to say or is your hand still up from before? So sorry, <laughs> my hand is still up, but I, I did want to follow up on Pete's comment and I apologize for being a bit contrarian, but I, I do have to hear. Um, look, this is a, a significant permanent impact on our town's landscape. And um, given that we don't know the scale of the resource coming in, I think we should look at this as a generational opportunity to buy significant land. You know, we know there's existing problems and I, and I want those fixed, but it seems like we should take this opportunity to to go beyond that scale i mean particularly you know given that we need to conserve 7000 acres in the next 8 years in order to reach 30% conserved and this could be a real opportunity to take a significantly quick step towards that goal um, so I'd, I'd really want to try to encourage us to think think beyond our current problems and think more about larger opportunities that we might be able to cultivate Nice. Um, are you all good to sort of end with that really great comment? Um, and next steps, um, what do you all think? What do we need to do? Well, I, I guess I would ask Flycatcher if there's any specific information that you're looking for from us that you didn't get, or um, how do we follow up with other comments or suggestions or input? Uh, yeah, I think um, if you could provide us the it was the Phillips Brook watershed plan and the uh, just the link to that. Oh, I guess that maybe they're on the site, the same one for the Red Brook watershed. Um, and I don't know if it's a shape file, but um, the mapping for the problem culverts crossings that would be great. Yeah, I don't know if we have it. In, I may we may have it in our GIS. I know we have it um, as a an appendix to the hazard mitigation plan. So I will send you what I can easily get um, and I'll check into the GIS layer for that as well. Perfect. Um, no, I think finding out about the, um, the mapping that the town already has uh, on the site showing the conserved land, we'll check that out and compare it to um, what, the, um, what the land trust has as well. Uh, I know Jesse's been doing some of this already, so I may, <laughs> she may already know some of this that I don't. So, um, so what what you're going to provide us there, I think, is is great. Um, happy for the opportunity to just chat with you all tonight about it and start to you know start to get the wheels turning and and um, maybe people will come up with some more um, specific sites. Uh, Jesse, I don't know if there's anything else that you're thinking of that we could we could use. Um, I don't think of anything specific. We have talked with the um, Scarborough Land Trust and they sent us some specific parcels that they wanted to prioritize. Um, so we have some of that visualized already, but yeah, if you guys do think of anything specific um, or like larger scale landscape connectivity and things like that, definitely like send that our way, it'd be great. I have one follow-up comment, and this is from another hat I wear from Friends of Scarborough Marsh, but the the Friends has, I don't know if you've engaged with them at all, but the Friends also has a list of priority parcels adjacent to the Scarborough Marsh and the watershed and the tributaries. So if you have not gotten that yet, I'd be happy to um, check in with the Friends to make sure that I can share that. We, we don't have that right, Justin. No, so yeah, if you, if you, that would be great if you could do that for us. I appreciate that. Um, and then we'll just stay posted about um, other times that we can come back to you or you can come back to us and we can keep, keep that going. But let's just um, have Noah's words ringing in our ear, the 7,000 acres that we're 
what we have as our goal in Scarborough by 2030. So um, thank you both for coming this evening. We'll look forward to more. Yeah, thank you all for the time. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you. Um, so today is, this, uh, I, I don't know, um, Marla's comment about the the marsh um, reminded me today I was um, in this workshop with somebody from Ohio the um, and who's working on um, sort of the Great Lakes area. And um, she said in their area, they uh, went from tree cover of 95% of the area to 20%. And they've lost 90% of their wetlands to development. Um, and so what they're seeing now is algae blooms in Lake Erie, as well as these other sort of permanent impacts. So um, that's the kind of thing that we don't want to see happen in Scarborough. And that's what we're all here together for. Um, let's have the lesson of what they're struggling with be our, our guide in a way. Um, uh, and thanks everyone for your comments and contributions there. So we're uh, moving to uh, what's here as old business is um, just about a month ago, we had the town council workshop that um, April called for and um, she circulated a, a really great written report, but if you would, wouldn't mind sort of bringing us up to speed about sure. that. Sure, I'm happy to. And I, and I want to piggyback on something you just said, because I really think that these workshops reflect our values. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to bring to the table, what we want to have as council consideration are our values. And so um, the it was a joint workshop between the council, conservation commission, and sustainability committee. Uh, the first half of the workshop was really, um, we discussed sustainability portion. Um, Rick Meinking was there um, to walk everyone through some of the sustainable building house practices that he would like to see. Um, we got an update um, and actually it's been the EV charger ordinance was on our agenda for the following meeting and that has been approved at first reading by the council to send to planning board. So that's a really great step um, for that ordinance development process. Um, and really the kind of focus where we are now as a council is We've given ourselves this stopgap um, and we haven't changed the pace of growth in the downs. We gave them less than 100 units a year, essentially, for the next three years. But we're now the focus is on making sure that our ordinances are caught up with so that the development that happens there and anywhere else in town reflects what we would like to see in terms of sustainability and conservation practices. And so that's the work that needs to happen now. Um, and in terms of the topics of discussion for Conservation Commission, again, we just talked about that goal of um, preserving land in Scarborough and, and how we're gonna hit that target. And then um, also we talked about trail connectivity and how developers can, can continue to contribute to that idea of trail connectivity in town. Um, I thought Councillor Anderson, uh, so another piece of this is that Councillor Anderson and Councillor McGee um, have been tasked by the council to work together to bring forward some GMO recommendations um, for council adoption. Um, and they have set them, they've set a deadline of April 2023 to have those recommendations kind of compiled and, and ready to um, have a public process put forward. And part of that, and it's in the packet, um, is Councillor Anderson, who is very organized, um, has created a set of questions that he would like to see um, committees, you know, have discussion around and then supply some answers to me and Nick about what your priorities are as a committee um, so that they can understand how to incorporate your feedback into their GMO process. And the last thing that I thought was really great that came out of the workshop was Councillor Anderson suggested that we as a council meet with sustainability and conservation, or at least get input from the two committees um, and develop a singular council goal for 2023 that is measurable um, and that you know we can use as one of our guiding principles for the next year. Um, and the example that was given was, you know, what if we said we're going to try and preserve 
um, more lands in 2023, you know, than we have up, up to this point. And so putting that bug out there that this, this is really, you know, on the council's plate now, like we, and we want to do some actionable work around these topics. Yeah, that's fantastic. So thank you for giving Exciting. me more to yes. all that. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for calling for the workshop and and uh, thank you, Chuck and Pete, Pete, for attending. I think that was everyone who attended. I hope I'm not leaving anybody out, um, but everyone contributing to mm -hmm. um, the ideas that got us to that place um, and the work that we have before us um, and the opportunity, really. And I, I just find that the, you know, um, I appreciate that you led with the values um, and this idea of guiding and having a council goal, um, but it still sort of hits at we have to create ordinances. <laughs> so yeah. it's the, the parallel track of um, uh, getting some real pieces in place to enable us to enact what we want to do, but also hold out the um, sort of the carrot, the way that we want people to move forward. Um, and so I think that's our work. We're going to have some time to talk about the GMO update um, and the, the questions there. But anybody have any other thoughts about the workshop or um, what April just said to us? Well, I just wanted to mention that it was, um, there was an article on the front page of the leader about um, our memo, which was great. And it took out some direct quotes and there's a photo of some of Martin Woods and it was you know, front page above the fold with the color photo. So. That was great. That means the media is interested and, um, you know, it's happy to see that. Yeah, that that was good news to see for sure. Thank you for calling attention to that. Um, okay, so uh, the next piece is the Maine Association of Conservation Commissions. I went to the annual conference on uh, October 22nd. Um, I'll send this in writing. Um, like it, like it, we did last year, but uh, just to, oh yeah, and we have some pretty visuals. Um, we had a presentation give, from, give me just a second okay. so I can get it shared for uh, people out in Zoom. Okay, and... so I'll talk, I'll talk to it. We had a, a presentation from um, the main leader of the National Parks Services Program of River Trails and Conservation Assistance, the RTCA. And um, the, uh, if you can go to the second page. They have some pretty big goals and they offer um, uh, assistance to um, towns and groups that are looking to do these kinds of activities. Um, they uh, assist public land managers and communities on um, um, restoring parks and conservation areas and rivers. Um, they also are looking at um, helping communities become resilient in a changing climate and um, developing local and regional conservation strategies. Uh, one example that she talked about, and you can go to the next page, just so you all have some visuals. Um, they helped Sanford develop a trails master plan, uh, which they called their blueprint for transforming Sanford's trail network into the best in New England. Um, so this, this really interconnected network of trails that they also want to be able to um, have be the pride of the community, create uh, voluntary and public connections to this whole system. She said that uh, they, they do select towns and communities to work with. They typically take on four projects a year and each of those projects generally span two to three years. So I feel like it's an opportunity for us potentially um, and we can continue the conversation with um, RTCA to see if Scarborough could um, have their support. Uh, it's not uh, a funding source for us, but it's essentially skilled yeah. pro bono, yeah, technical assistance. Um, and then we went around like we do each year of uh, Conservation Commission, thanks for sharing that. Sure. Um, member share, and here's Conservation Commissions around the state are doing things like 
uh, enacting a pesticide ordinance, a tree and shade tree ordinance, low impact development ordinance, um, increasing the buffers um, in their shoreland zone, um, doing educational walks around invasive plants, doing programs in local schools, some, some is leading a junior conservation program, um, and a meet your animal neighbors program, uh, um, doing a habitat assessment, enacting habitat mitigation fees, a microplastics ban, mapping their tree canopy. So the activities of conservation commissions are uh, diverse um, and um, uh, and it's great to, to have these connections and a, and a network of people to reach out to. Um, so that's my longer than I thought report. Um, and then we have a great report out from the education subcommittee. Shall I start with that? I think I think um, I will. I can speak a little bit, but Emily, you can as well, and Chuck and Rita. We don't we don't have a chair of the Soul Subcommittee. We can all work together. So so I'll I'll start. We've had three meetings. We had two in October and one in in November. And our first meeting was really just a brainstorming session. So we came up with. Um, and topics for educational walks and talks and work, workshops and articles and things like that. And we really want to collaborate with our local organizations like the Scrubber Land Trust and the Library and the Friends of Scrubber Marsh because they're doing such great work anyway. And uh, we feel like we could just create some events and uh, collaborate with them and really get some synergy around that. And also they are able to um, um, advertise this sort of thing to their members and on their website and social media. So uh, we did talk about um, the 30 by 30, which is, I guess, is the 30% of land protection by 2030. So um, we want to think about how we can do that and educate people about that idea. Um, we just discussed something about the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act, which was which is this year, 2022. Um, but we are really looking forward to 2023 at this point. It's sort of late in the year and just going as a subcommittee. Um, and uh, we did talk about best ways to strengthen town ordinances. I'm not exactly sure how our education committee will, will do that, but potentially somehow um, engaging the public, maybe a workshop, maybe an article, I'm not really sure. Uh, we haven't really just worked that out, but I think we are just, actually, I'm pretty new to this conservation vision, and now I sort of have a better understanding of how these things work, um, especially the, the GMO that was very um, educational for me. So I'm gonna pass this on to maybe Emily or Rita um, to add, about some of the things that we're working on this year. Sure. Go ahead, Rita. Okay. Um, our um, October 25th meeting, um, we discussed the need to educate the public and build goodwill basically by hosting events and co sponsoring activities like the Marsh cleanups. Um, that are organized generally by Friends of Scarborough Marsh and, and Maine Audubon, but also trail cleanups and invasive removal events uh, for, for SLT. Um, Marla has um, offered to um, contact Catherine Hewitt, a teacher at Wentworth, um, who is interested in working with the uh, Conservation Commission to offer students outdoor learning opportunities uh, and uh, Marla will also ask Noah to um, uh, kind of work with Catherine, hopefully, on this, uh, connecting the two of them uh, and perhaps uh, some of Noah's students. Um, Chuck and Rita um, have offered to explore uh, and to research sort of open space and climate action plans, um, looking at um, the types of plans that are already in place uh, in places like Cumberland and Topsom, Portland and South Portland. Um, 
and to also look at the, the Maine Association of Conservation Commission's Climate Change Planning Resource webpage. I think there's a lot of information there uh, that would be very useful. Um, Marl uh, off, also offered to speak with Fred Snow uh, of the Association of Conservation Commissions uh, and to look at their website to develop several educational um, articles uh, on the history, mission, and current projects of conservation commissions in Maine, including our own. Um, and then kind of looked at some um, possible winter programs, winter tracking perhaps with the library, an, an Earth Day event, um, and also mentioned a plant, plant walk with Emily uh, on identification and medicinal uses of plants. And we also, at the end of that meeting, um, which Randy attended, um, Randy has uh, set up a link for our subcommittee to share documents and resources that is also, uh, which is already being very, very helpful to us. So thank you, Randy, for doing that. And then pass this on to, to Chuck, perhaps, or, or Emily, if she is on. Sure, we talked about um, uh, ed having educational workshops that uh, would collaborate with different organizations. So we talked about the uh, land trust in Boston and so forth. But we also mentioned the Maine Coastal Heritage Trust, which would have you know towns like ours, and uh, um, and we understand that they have a lot of uh, quite a, a group of speakers in that organization and. Uh, so um, that could happen too. And to maximize use of the library uh, and build that uh, relationship with the library. We also talked about uh, um, doing something uh, on the line of what happened in uh, Freeport. Freeport Climate Action Network organized an electrification of Freeport event. And they had 400 people show up at that event. And they uh, showed up everything uh, electrical that replaces uh, gas and oil and coal, and, you know, uh, just um, heat pumps and cars and uh, uh, stoves uh, uh, and uh, all the gadgets. And um, and there were there were speakers from uh, 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 what's what's Rick's organization? Efficiency. Efficiency name. name and uh, and uh, several other. Um, large organizations that will uh, 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 the, uh, what, was, what was the big the big solar company revision revision yeah mm -hmm. of course they were there they were always there they were, uh, <laughs> they were at my house cleaning my pump today <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, yeah that's that would be a big undertaking they put a lot of time and effort into it and they actually got a grant for it but I think if the, if the Sustainability Committee and the Conservation Commission collaborated on that, perhaps with others, uh, we could put something together that's uh, really good and really worthwhile. Did you have anything to add? I think you all covered it. And I was <laughs> not attending the night, the uh, November 9th meeting, so I think that's what Chuck was mostly referring to. Okay. I just wanted to mention that we, we are going to create a, a a plan for 2023. So we'll have a bunch of these things and we'll try to figure out the dates. And we want to do some things quarterly. And so we'll have some, some structure to our work moving forward. And we're also, I, I realized today that we um, should probably write a little report and send it, have it sent out with the materials. So we're going to do that for the next meeting. Great. Your piece went a long way to being that report. Yeah. <laughs> do um, um did, did uh could we preview what these quarterly events might be? Oh sure, yes, yes. I mean actually Rita, you should talk about your idea. Yeah, yes, yeah. this is so great. Yes. Sure, sure. Um we um certainly want to work with uh, with the land trust um and their communications education and outreach committee. Um just we probably will uh, meet with them pretty early in January uh, to uh, plan some co-hosting events for 2023. Andrew was, um, you know, very um, happy to do that. Um, 
one of the things that I have been thinking about um, is uh, a possible four part um, land conservation and climate change speaker series um, in partnership with the land trust. And I was thinking in terms of um, focusing on Scarborough Marsh, uh, then the five rivers uh, in Scarborough that uh, empty into that marsh, um, upland forests, and then the connected wildlife habitat and why they matter in a changing climate. Um, and as Chuck mentioned, uh, we're thinking of possible speakers from the Maine Coast Heritage Trust for that. And um, venues probably would be the public library or the uh, Scarborough Public Safety Conference room. Um, so that's just uh, in the initial planning stages and discussion stages with, with the land trust. Um, thank you all. So that's really exciting. Uh, uh, an active working committee has met several times outside of our commission meetings to come up with a plan for 2023 and think about ways to engage uh, residents in the um, in understanding what we're up to and, and engage them in our in the work along with us. So thank you all for um, your time and and focus on this. It's uh, there's a lot um, to consider. I see Pete's got his hand raised. Yeah, I, I, first of all, I just want to say kudos on some really good thoughts, great work. Um, I love the climate change four-part workshop that you talked about. Um, uh, just another topic maybe for consideration is um, what other communities are doing to engage with their citizenry on two things. Um, the use of organic pesticides on private property, and then number two, um, how other communities are going to engage on the concepts of creating and maintaining pollinator habitat because the two kind of go hand in hand. I thought that'd be a really good thing to touch on. I know some other communities are starting to really, really tackle um, that issue up front by doing on the ground stuff. So just a, just a thought there. Great. That's great. And the, um, another opportunity to engage other conservation commissions who established ordinances um, that probably had many activities leading up to that point um, as well um, on those topics. So I don't I don't really know what the Garden Club does, but is that another organization that might be interested in, in sure. connecting yeah. about yeah, and start and what, on. yeah <laughs> and what Pete was saying about the pollinators and the and the pesticides and like only the garden club. We have several members uh, um, on the uh, CEO committee, actually, who are uh, Scarborough uh, garden member, gardening members. So uh, great idea. We'll be hopefully talking with them. And I just want to chime in since the idea has already kind of been mentioned a little bit uh, this evening is uh, collaborating with a sustainability committee and also um, an electrify event. So the sustainability committee met a couple weeks ago. Um, and discuss the possibility of doing a community event, probably centered around Earth Day, and talking about a broad range of sustainable related topics. So electrification, um, solar, uh, electric vehicles, but um, there are so many other things that could tie into that, like recycling, um, healthy lawn care, um, and land conservation. So um, they had talked about having asking the council to proclaim a sustainable Scarborough Day and that that would be around the time that um, this event would happen. Um, and there will definitely be opportunities for Conservation Commission to, um, to participate and help coordinate that um, because it will be a fairly large undertaking. Um, but thinking timing around Earth Day, so April 22nd, which happens to be a Saturday in 2023, um, so it might kind of might work out, although that would interfere with um, Scarborough Marsh cleanup. So, uh, or it could be Okay, now we all go over to the marsh. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, That's yeah, definite opportunities to kind of continue this conversation, and hopefully, we can pull something together for the spring. Nice, great, great, great. All right, That's exciting. Um, so we are just a little over, but I think we're still doing pretty well on time. On um, under new business, we have um, what April teased out for us um, 
Councillors Anderson and McGee are looking for committees to um, provide feedback as they work on a GMO revision. And the questions that were posed in the packet for the council meeting last week mm -hmm. are here. Um, and uh, I believe this is ongoing work for us. We've outlined a lot of that in the joint memo, but there's more of our work that um, that's uh, noted in our goals. But essentially, as it relates to growth management ordinance, how does growth impact the work of your committee? We, um, uh, and then how would you like the town to address and review as they update the GMO? What suggestions do we have for the council? And is there any an opportunity to establish incentives for growth permits within GMO and provide benefits around projects that support our goals? So um, this is a, as I understand it, they're on a, pretty relatively short timeline i mean very um i think it was april so you know we're going to be su proclaiming sustainable scarborough day perhaps and um <laughs> and wrapping up the gmo update around the same time they, they want our feedback in three weeks <laughs> yes yes so i um they do want our feedback soon that's their their timeline is um short um i don't know april if you have any suggestions about how we might be able to do that or um, if anyone here has some initial thoughts. I can share that. Um, so it is counselors Anderson and McGee who are kind of leading that this process from the counselor side of things. But um, Autumn Spear, our planning director, and Karen Martin, uh, executive director of SEDCO, are also supporting that. I believe there's a meeting later on this week where they're going to kind of finalize the questions that they want for committees. So I suspect that the themes are going to be the same, but the specific questions may change a bit. And they are looking for feedback in December. I think I don't think December 9th is a hard, hard date, I think, um, because a lot of committees, if you're not paying attention to what's in the council packet, you don't even know that this is coming necessarily. Mm -hmm. So um so Autumn is going to be doing some outreach to the committees with these questions to try to um, either get feedback from the liaisons or she will attend the committee meetings um, to get that information. She did offer, um, she may be available to attend um, our December meeting to kind of work through some of these questions um, if that's an interest. Um, but I don't think we need to have answers to these questions tonight or even before our next meeting. Um, we just need to be prepared soon after our next meeting to, to give them answers to the questions that they're looking for. Um, once we are given the official questions that they want those answers okay. to, yeah. um, because they may change, like I said. Maybe not so broadly or drastically, but similar, yeah. so on a similar path any, anyway. Um, you know, I think for me, what's... Uh, what I still kind of struggle to wrap my head around is the GMO path and which we started going down that road again to try to address what was in the GMO or a waiver request to the GMO. And we had some specific pieces on that. Um, but then there are broader ordinance, new ordinances or changes to ordinances that um, we're hearing and uh, that is the right path for us and that we would frankly like to um, implement. So how do we how does how do we tie all of this in together? What's the best way to do that? Um, use this question process to start to feed that information in or um, respond specifically to what's in what's in here. Do you have a sense of that? Or the others I have ideas. I mean, I think that's the million dollar question, yeah. right? Is is where we have two trains that still, even though we stopped one train for a little while, it, we still have these kind of two different tracks that we're on, which is do we should we focus on ordinance changes um and make that our priority, or should we still contribute to this idea that maybe the new GMO will still have an exemption process? And what do we want our feedback to be for that exemption process? Uh, and I think that that's I think that that's good feedback for John and Nick. And mm -hmm. I'll definitely relay that to them that committees are are starting to um or continuing to struggle mm -hmm. with, with that separate um, notion. Um I, I would be curious to see if that 
helps them refine their questions, maybe even just making sure that they are aware that committees are kind of trying to juggle both of those tasks. Um, I think that probably it's two separate discussions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Does it come to a resolution that there's one path or the other in the end? I think both paths are going yeah. to be followed. Yeah. Um, I think the GMO path is the priority at this point, since the council has imposed a deadline of April to have that revised. Um, and ordinance changes are a much longer term process. I mean, the GMO is an ordinance, but I mean, it's council driven as opposed to the changes that we would like to see will be committee driven. Um, and so there will be a number of steps that um, we'll need to, to follow to make those happen. Um, but the counselors at the workshop did seem to indicate that there was support for incorporating um, some of the concepts that were provided to them in the memo into our into our ordinances. It's a matter of finding where they fit um, and finding the language that um, that will work in Scarborough and the requirements that will work in Scarborough. Um, Pete and then Jessica. Yeah, I understand it's, a, it's going to be a dual tracked uh, effort, um, of course, but we do have a unique opportunity with the fast track timeline on the GMO. Uh, and I understand totally that there is consideration for taking the things that we put in our memo and trying to incorporate it in the GMO. But I think that should really be one of our priority efforts, um, because to me, it makes sense if you're going to be toying with the GMO right now. <laughs> It certainly makes sense to try to tie in some of those conservation efforts that we've um, raised in terms of say the you know by 2030 conserve 30 percent of the land or whatever the st statistics that we threw around were in the memo um, because it would be really really good i think if that is fast tracked then at least it's tagged along as the as the little red caboose or whatever on that effort um, while we also work at the same time because gmo doesn't cover you know all the development in town while we try to um, tackle the other conservation related issues with other growth aspects of the town in, through ordinances. So that seems to me like a, a logical way of going forward. Thanks. Thank you. Jessica. I was thinking along the same lines. Uh, you know, I think our ultimate goal is an ordinance or ordinances. So why can't we preview those with the GMO? You know, I think in the memo, we were pretty straightforward that uh, part of it was that, you know, we want to see additional conservation. And, you know, I think that the, the types and the level of conservation are yet to be, ter ter be determined. But why couldn't we look at that as another opportunity with the GMO and then go through this longer process of, of getting the, the ordinance? Yeah, thank you. I just from my experience developing an ordinance, our EV charging ordinance has been in development since June of 2021. Yeah. So you just had your first reading. And we just got our first reading. So um it is a, a much longer process because there are many steps that we need to go through. We need to come up with the language and agree on it as a group. We need to vet it with our, the ordinance committee. They usually take at least two meetings to go through that, and then it needs to go to council. So, um, and for for their process, and after council, it goes to planning board, and then back to council. So it is a, a pretty extensive process. So. Um, I don't know that we will be able to say that we can introduce ordinance changes at the same time as the GMO, because I just don't think we're going to be ready for that. Oh, I meant that concept, you know, that okay. it's a way to test the concept versus having the hammered out mm -hmm. ordinance language. Yeah, like, like we're not going to give up on including additional conservation in the GMO while we also go down this other track, the slower process of uh, creating an ordinance that would apply to all development town-wide. I will say, I think these questions were developed, um, keeping in mind that not all committees even have this on their radar. Mm -hmm. And so 
Conservation Commission, Sustainability Committee are probably much further down the path to having these questions already answered and the materials already prepared. You guys have already had a lot of this discussion. And so while these seem like really broad, open-ended questions for you guys, like mm -hmm. other committees, this is the first time they're going to have mm -hmm. a conversation around this. So it's kind of a different frame from where you guys are coming from. Right. Okay. So question. Can you um, tell me about the timeline of this, of the GMO from the beginning? Like, mm -hmm. you know, where did it even start? Like, who started this idea? And... Like when was it passed and how long was it on the books before? Sure. This so so moratorium. we're required to have a, a GMO. Um, and the previous GMO, which governed development, used a fractionalization process to give out building permits. And so a one bedroom unit would be a fraction of a permit rather than an, an entire permit. And there was also a mechanism within the old GMO where if all of the permits got used, the council could by vote add permits to the pool. And so prior council, prior to me joining the council, felt like that growth was not really being managed in a way that was understandable or that could be tracked all that well. Um, there was a different process for when you could apply for the permit versus when the permit was granted. And so Two years ago, they began work on what is now the GMO that has been adopted. It was adopted in June of 2021. And almost immediately after it was adopted, the Downs applied for an exemption to the process. And so the reason being that the Downs thought that they had a plan and a certain number of units that were going to be allocated to them, and then the newly adopted GMO put a heavy restriction on that. And so they knew that they were, when they uh, when they accepted the GMO in the council, they knew that the Downs was going to have to apply for an exemption. I don't think anyone anticipated the um, confusion that the exemption process would bring. <laughs> um, but we spent a, almost a year as a council trying to navigate um, an exemption request from the Downs um, that was negotiated with various members of council and Tom and legal. And we just couldn't come to any kind of agreement. And so the end result that happened a few weeks ago in September was the council said, we're not going to take any more exemptions until we've taken a look at our exemption process because this just isn't working. What we did for the downs and for another development in town was grant a certain number of permits that would allow them to continue to build that was in line with the pace of growth that's set out by them. There. That's the point. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, so just a note on um, the downs. Uh, and since our last meeting, the planning board had a meeting on November 1st, which I only just listened to um, by recording. Uh, and things that came up in their master plan amendment discussion with the planning board included uh, concepts like conservation easements, vernal pool and wetlands impacts, an open space plan, um, trails that could go to state land, connections to the land trust property, contiguous natural habitat. Um, and I, as I understand, a lot of these concepts um, uh, were in response to staff comments and likely our joint memo and other um, community uh, comments. So there's a another planning board meeting. They're going to be coming back with a revised master plan. Um, anybody who can attend and make public comment is always welcome to do that and encouraged. Um, and uh, and we continue our work. Eric, do you know the date that they'll be on the agenda? Yeah, uh, it'll be a week from tonight, the twenty first. Um, so the next item on old business is um oh plant we're not, I don't know. Oh, it's actually new business. New business. So new business. business scheduling the election. Scheduling election with the chair and the yeah. vice chair. So last year um I was uh elected yay as chair of the commission. 
Uh, I'm enjoying this and I would be happy to continue if you'd have me, but I um, I am also committed to, committed to having uh, an election process and that we set that up. And But we also would like to have a vice chair because I think we talked about it last time. This was around the time that we were bringing in um, members of PMAC and we hadn't sort of sorted that out. So now that we're all a group, I'd like to, um, um, to have a, a folks um, think about serving as vice chair as well. So we're going to do that at the next meeting. Yeah. Your nominations would take place then, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah that's how we would do it. Yeah. Um, and just to put a plug in, I believe that there are three members of the commission whose terms are technically expiring in 2023. Um, they're Noah. At the end of this year. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 2022. Let's yeah. not jump the gun. 2022. <laughs> um, so if they're Noah, Pete, and Chuck. So um, Toby should be reaching out to you um, to see if you want to continue uh, serving on the Conservation Commission. Um, and Or you can reach out to her proactively and let her know if you continue um, to stay on. And since we've been having so much... Oh, no, go ahead. I was going to say, usually the process is... It's usually the process is Cody reaches out to see if you want to continue. And if you do, you'll be reappointed. And if not, then um, they'll, you know, you can, you'll be, you'll remove yourself from the commission. And um, I believe that there may be others um, in the queue who have expressed interest in joining the commission or the, um, the form to fill out to express interest is available on the town's website under, I think, the committee's uh web page on the, the town website um just for anybody who might be listening in and would like to serve on the commission and i also just want to put a plug in we've been talking a lot about planning board and what the planning board is doing there are vacancies on the planning board so if anybody has any interest um they are alternate seats i do believe so a little bit less uh uh commitment at this point um but if anybody's interested in learning more about planning board and um having a say in in development, um, I encourage you to look into that as an option as well. I think it'd be really beneficial to have um, somebody sort of jointly on uh, Conservation Commission and Planning Board until we establish that link as a as a known desire. Um, and I lost my thought about the help. what I was going to follow up on that. Oh, um, so. We, we we also changed last year the composition of the um, the conservation commission where we have seven voting members and two alternates. Um, but we welcome anybody who wants to be part of the commission as volunteers and support. We're going to need all of that when we do this rousing day in in April, and we have these really great outreach to um, uh, the residents over through education and. Uh, engagement opportunities, and we get closer and closer to the 30 by 30 goal. Um, so um, everyone is welcome in my books. Um, How long is the period of service? What's the term? Is it two or three years? I think it's two years. It might be three, but I think it's two years. <laughs> so, I, I do have a question. Let's just say if somebody were to leave, not one of the voting members. Mm -hmm. Or to leave. Oh, do they move alternates? The, do the alternates move into those positions? Or so do they stay that, alternates? That is ultimately the, dis, the decision of the appointments committee and the town council, but that's typically the practice is that an alternate moves into um, a full spot and then um, another person will become an alternate. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's safety, yes. Oh, I did have a thought Absolutely. that, you know, maybe. So we have somebody who wants to serve on both planning and board and, and <laughs> conservation commission. Um, you could list the upcoming, you know, under the upcoming dates, you could list those dates and maybe yeah, we sure. could alternate and like we could all like you know go for one meeting. <laughs> but so you'd have representation yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Better than having nobody I'm going. Yeah. I, I can't once a month. I can't they meet every, every three, three weeks. weeks. I probably could go to one, you know, one. but not. So re recently. related to that, um, Eric Autumn and I sat down today um, to talk about um, a number of things, but one item was um, trying to formalize the relationship between Conservation Commission and Planning Board. Um, and I did send Randy an email about that, but Autumn suggested that we 
draft a policy for how, um, like what threshold um, development might need to trigger to, um, or meet to trigger a review by Conservation Commission. So if it meets certain criteria, the planning board would automatically request that uh, Conservation Commission review the um, certain elements of the, the proposed development. So um, I suggested that that might be on our um, an upcoming agenda. And Autumn is available to um, come to our meeting in um, January to kind of um, like talk about our initial, the group's initial thoughts about that and try to come up with um, a draft policy that can be reviewed by planning board. And then I don't know who else would need to approve that if it would be council action or if it's just mm -hmm. kind of a policy um, that the, the, the two groups follow. I'm not sure what the process is beyond that. That's something that we'll have to look into. Good. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, updates, uh, anything new on town council? Okay. Uh, planning board? Uh, the board approved AR building on uh, its November 1st meeting. Um, so they are now working with us on getting their building permits. That's uh, the Muzzy Road. Oh, yeah. Muzzy oh. and Gorm Road, oh, the okay. apartments. Yep. What did you call it? AR, A AR building. Yep. Um, but I think that's pretty much it. I mean, as Jamie had mentioned earlier in the meeting, actually, I think it was you, April. Um, the board is going to be hearing the uh, proposed changes to the performance standards for utility scale mm -hmm. uh, for uh, the uh, EV charging. Uh, the parking standards for the EV um, EV charging, uh, as well as some other site plan review requirements. So um, we'll be doing that in December. But that's it. Yes, and those that those public hearings happen on the same night as our conservation commission meeting. So that's another thing is that oftentimes, well, a couple times a year, conservation commission will overlap with um, planning board. Um, so just something to be aware of with that as well. Maybe we could jointly meet for an hour <laughs> on something. Um, Typically the, the planning board doesn't have a spare hour because right. their meetings yeah. are totally packed. Yeah. So but there would be it would be good to have some overlap there. And you've already on the sustainability committee, you've mentioned the good news about EV charging. EV charging, yeah, going to public hearing at planning board. And then the other item that I had was the sustainable Scarborough day. So um, I will keep you all in the loop um, with that. And perhaps we can talk about um, maybe the education committee and a subcommittee of sustainability kind of joining forces to, um, to help plan that. I think that that would be really helpful. Um, so I'll bring that to sustainability as well, that suggestion. Um, and then I had on here, we've added transportation committee um, for a regular update. Um, so the, uh, we have just come out with a map of um, transportation projects in the public right of way that's available on the town website. Um, so these are um, town projects, state projects from DOT or Maine Turnpike Authority and um, projects that are done um, by developers um, as a condition of their um, development. So the Downs is well represented on the transportation map. Um, it's available in the what's happening section of the town website and also in the um, the engineering and technical services department page. There's a link from there as well, and I'll include it um, in the, the meeting minutes so you all can get it, um, get to it. But it basically is color coded so you can see kind of who is responsible for the various projects. Um, gives a brief overview of what they are and why they're happening and then someone to contact either in the town with DOT MTA um, or with a private developer to understand if you have any specific questions or anything like that. So um, it's a, a really good resource um, and it will be updated as new projects come online. Um, it also kind of tries to lay out for the projects that we're aware of the time frame that they're happening. It includes the time frame. So um, I think it can go out as much as five years into the future because that's where the town's um, Capital improvement plan usually spans five years. So with some of the projects we have, they're planned out far in advance. So that's on there. Um, Councilor Corner Live in October focused on transportation. Um, so there was a lot of good discussion and feedback there. A lot of it related to changes on Payne Road because of the downs. Mm -hmm. um, 
So there is a recording available of that for anyone who may not have, have watched it. Um, and then the other item that they're working on, um, in addition to their transportation study, is Vision 5 of the comp plan, which is very much dedicated to transportation. Um, and the transportation study will help inform their work on, on Vision 5 of the comp plan as they're starting to dive into that. That is in transportation. Um, and then uh, this is skipping forward, but on upcoming dates, especially in November 19th, the Conservation Commission is uh, co sponsoring. Uh, Marla, do you want to say about this workshop? Yes. So, Project Grace is uh, working with the Scarborough Public Library to host a weatherization workshop. This is this coming Saturday, 9 30 to 10 30. And I think Chuck, you said you're going to go. I'm hoping to go as well to represent the Conservation Commission. I don't think we're going to get to do anything. <laughs> I think Stephanie from Project Grace has got it all, um, all planned out. But yeah, we want to encourage people to come. And you know, we want to just build collaborations. And it's great to already start collaborating with Project Grace and the libraries. That's Saturday, 9 30. Can you explain a little bit of how the, how the program works? Just because the project race administers what kind of, what monies, charitable monies? Yeah, it's um, a 501c3, so it's a nonprofit organization. So donations. Yes, they accept donations. And they have a, I think they only have one staff person, Stephanie Cox. So she is the executive director. She used to work for me in Audubon. Um, she used to be on the. She used to be the chair of the conservation commission, the Scarborough Conservation. Commission. And it's all about Scarborough homes. Yes. Yeah. Weatherization. That's all I know. Like it. You know, easy things that you could do. And to efficient, get ready for for winter. And efficiency yeah. main um, just launched a, a rebate program, so up to a hundred dollars um, reimbursed for the cost of weatherization supplies, like weather stripping and. Um, like shrink wrap on your windows and things like that. So just talking about easy things that people can do to help keep the heat in their homes this winter, especially because it's going to cost us all so much money to heat our homes this winter. Um, so there is that um, that rebate program available that um, will be discussed and then just doing um, some DIY um, and uh, demonstrations for easy things that people can do to seal up their homes and um, hopefully keep the heat in in the winter. Oh, yes, you'll be there. I'll be there right there. She's the one who really does. <laughs> I'm just going to show up. But no, it's totally <laughs> Stephanie. She's the one that, that coordinated yeah. all of this. I helped get some materials and stuff together for her, but it's all Stephanie. And um, our next meeting is December 12th, which is after Thanksgiving. So uh, this is my chance to express gratitude for all of you and the time that you give. And um, I'm yeah, I'm just grateful to be with a group of people who love the natural resources of Scarborough like I do, and just such smart people who contribute in many different ways. Thank you. Uh, motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Thanks for keeping us on track. <laughs> yeah, very impressive. 7.35. Very impressive. We fall behind and then we catch up. It's, it's impressive. <laughs> Thank you thank all. You. Have a great yeah, Thanksgiving. Thank we don't see you before. Happy Thanksgiving. Yep. Take care, everyone. Bye.